The City Double Cash Card presents tips for talking sports at the office. Number eight, be informed. I'm going to list some random stats that don't really mean anything. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I'm nodding, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, that's not working. Wouldn't it be great if everyone said what they meant? The City Double Cash Card does. It lets you earn double cash back with 1% when you buy and 1% as you pay. The City Double Cash Card. Double means double. No way I can let another day go by without shouting out the home team, Cleveland Indians. 21 game winning streak. What y'all doing right now? Keep it going. I was about to say it's incredible, but I wanna I wanna come back and do another video when y'all got like a 40 game winning streak. No pressure. No pressure, I get it. The Cleveland Windians is what y'all name gonna be soon, so you might wanna trade I might wanna trademark that so I can sell a couple t-shirts or something. The Windians, that's, that's catchy. Not, it is. I like that's that. What's good? <laughs> Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. You're looking at the best team on TV. And you just heard the best player in the world marveling with the rest of us as we watch the best team in baseball put together the best winning streak many of us have ever seen. We'll put 21 straight into perspective straight ahead and coming up a showdown between two members of the 400 touchdown pass club along with whether Russ's club should be worried that he hasn't signed their extension But yet. we begin with these Windians. Uh, don't worry, Cleveland fans. Uh, your team, let's just say today, they kind of knew uh, what you were here for, right? Uh, the Tigers, uh, they hit the Indians with a rock, and Cleveland responded with a boulder. Jay Bruce with a three-run shot that put Cleveland up 3-1. to one. Roberto Perez added a solo home run, and Lonnie Chisenhall, well, you're going to see in a moment this very nice catch uh, that he had to end the game. Uh, American League history made here today. Uh, many Indians fans on hand. So here comes that catch right there. See, put a little exclamation point. When the sun's shining, everything's rolling. I'm saying everything goes right. Uh, but uh, in case it bears repeating, the Indians, they have now passed the 2002 Athletics for the longest win streak in AL history. And here's another fun fact you can repeat at parties about this streak. The Indians have actually hit more home runs during this streak than the total runs that they've allowed. Here's Terry Francona on the win. I, I mean, I think they're enjoying themselves. I, they should. I mean, they're, you know, they're, I think what's kind of cool about our game is when you do things and you do them the right way, like hitting streaks or, you know, I think it means more when you're not going out of your way to, you know, like with a hitting streak, somebody hits 3-0 you know, when you're down five runs. And our guys are playing the game to win the right way. So that part's really meaningful. Um, you know, they, they, they should enjoy what they're doing. It's, it's pretty special. Well, everyone talks about, you know, the streak and being consumed with it. What consumes us is the daily, you know, kind of schedule and game that, you know, we have to, we have to get ready for. Um, I thought we were playing the Royals today. <laughs> Now, the bosses have told Pedro Gomez that he is not to leave the Indians until they lose. So, Pedro, maybe you should think about getting an Ohio driver's license at this point. But real quick, I want the Indians <laughs> fans to cover their ears because here's a stat that might hurt. No team that's won 20 or more in a row has gone on to win the World Series. So, with that being Small said, <laughs> Pedro, how do the players think that this streak will correlate to the postseason? You know, one of the biggest reasons they think that that's not really a factor here is because they're playing such good baseball, like you heard Terry Francona there say. It's not like they're going out of their way to do something special. They This is just a byproduct of the way they play the game. They don't think there's going to be any correlation once you get to October. But in terms of the streak... You always hear baseball players trying to play it cool, like, no, I don't even know. I don't know. How many games have we won? Well, these Indians, they know. We're aware of the streak, but I think what, what we're doing right now, we're just going out there, having fun, and, and compete. And, I mean, our, our starting pitching, I mean, it's been unbelievable. And, uh, I mean, what can I say? I mean, that's, 
I'm excited. It's fun. You know, it's definitely fun to show to the ballpark right now. Uh, I think the last thing anybody wants in there is an off day. Um, but, you know, you can't, you never take anything for granted in this game, whether it's a five-game winning streak uh, or you go do something crazy like this and win 21 straight. Today was probably the first day I kind of crept in there because it's uh, gotten a lot of attention now. We're obviously at 20. We're going for the record. And, uh, you know, it's kind of passing the hot potato. But, I mean, <laughs> we're setting the standards each time we go out there. So then... Each starting pitchers follow suit with those standards. It's something cool to say. Um, I've been winning for three weeks in a row. Um, something special, something that uh, is in the history books, and we're blessed to be part of this. And we thank the fans for showing up every day. Now, one thing to keep in mind here the Kansas City Royals come in for a four game streak. Wins number two, three, and four of this 21-game streak were against the Royals, a three-game series right here at Progressive Field three weeks ago, and the Indians outscored them 20 to nothing. Another little point, Andrew Miller, maybe the best reliever in all of baseball, mm -hmm. scheduled to come off the disabled list tomorrow and be ready for these Royals. Yeah, this streak is anything but fluky, Pedro. So you hear that word, fun, fun, fun. <laughs> Shout out to Confunction. You heard that a few times uh, you know, during those locker room interviews just now. You're talking about an organization that came into this season, obviously losing in heartbreaking fashion in the World Series. So unfinished yeah. business, if you will. You have an organizational title drought spanning decades, and yet they're in the moment enjoying this streak. You're embedded with this club. What are you seeing in the clubhouse pre-game, post-game, and just your interactions with people in the organization, how are they able to balance expectations, being good, talking heads, talking <laughs> about whether it's ever going to matter without a World Series versus just living in the moment with the day-to-day? -day. Is it Terry Francona? Is it certain players? Who's driving this fun bus? It definitely starts with Francona, but I can tell you this, though. In the corner of the clubhouse, over by Jason Kipnis's locker, Michael Brantley, who's also injured right now, there is a shrine to Joe Boo, Remember Joe Boo from oh, the movie yeah, Major, Major League? League. <laughs> they have absolutely, they, you know, remember that was the Indians. They have Joe Boo rum, which is a thing, by the way. Joe Boo statues with the cigars in their mouth. Oh, okay. Well, that explains and they kind of pay homage to it every day. So there you go. <laughs> So it's not about these great starts. It's about paying homage to Major League. There you go. Love it. All right, Pedro, thank you so much, man. Get comfortable. You might be there for a while longer. Uh, the Indians, excuse me, the Windians streak started back on August 24th and has included sweeping two different doubleheaders. Shout out to Ernie Banks. Since this run started, every other AL team has lost at least eight games. They got seven shutouts in this streak. That's more than 14 teams. The 21 straight wins, of course, tied for the second longest streak in the modern era with the 35 Cubs. Only the 1916 Giants, and yeah, we know about the tie, mm -hmm. have posted a longer streak. That team, of course, finished fourth in the National League. That means absolutely nothing, though. This is present. Pass is not prologue. Tim Kirchner is here in the present. You're in Boston for tonight's A's Red Sox game. More on that in a minute. First, Tim, though, let's talk about the Windians, as LeBron dubs them. <laughs> Rank this winning streak against other streaks from a historical perspective. How do you put it into context? Well, Michael, it's certainly the greatest, most dominating streak I've ever seen a major league team put together, and I've covered baseball for almost 40 years. But it's almost by definition, when you go back to 1935 and you don't have anything like this, no one's ever seen anything quite like this. And they've outscored their opponents by 104 runs in 21 games. That's absurd. The last team to have anything close to that or like that is the 1939 Yankees, which is one of the greatest teams of all time. They had a run differential of plus 411, the greatest run differential in baseball history in any season. So we're only talking about teams that played in 35, <laughs> 1960, 1939. That just tells you the magnitude of what's going on here in Cleveland. Now, Tim, you've been around baseball long enough to know that a lot of times how you play in September doesn't exactly translate to October. So what have you seen from the Indians club that leads you to believe that what we're seeing now from them might translate into some postseason success? Well, I think they had the best team in the American League coming into this season mm -hmm. after getting Edwin Encarnacion as a free agent. They really bulked up that lineup, and their team right now is demonstrably better than the team they had at this time last year. And now you throw in 
21 consecutive wins. Then you throw in Andrew Miller, the great secret weapon that they have that really nobody else has in the American League. It's amazing what this team's done. And then you add in, say, Jay Bruce. Terry Francona told us that he went to the GM, you know, three, four weeks ago and said, what are we getting Jay Bruce? He was kidding. And the <laughs> next day they got Jay Bruce. That's how it works for the Indians this year. And yeah. they'll roll into October as the best team in baseball. And they're rolling along with several key players missing, as you mentioned. All right, to the Red Sox now, where you are. Uh, Doug Fist is on the mound tonight. After Chris Sale, what do you anticipate the Sox postseason rotation looking like, Tim? Well, that's unclear at this point. Drew Pomerantz has got to be in there. He's 15-5 and five with an ERA well under four. But Doug Fister is the interesting guy now. He's basically been their best starter for the last four times out. He's been really good, 1.50 ERA. They also have Rick Porcello, who's had a difficult season, 17 losses, but he is the reigning Cy Young winner in the American League. And David Price threw today in a simulated okay. game here at Fenway. I watched him. I don't anticipate him being in the rotation in the postseason. Maybe he can help out in the bullpen, but it's really important to see how Doug Fister finishes this year because he's worked himself into the conversation for maybe being in the postseason rotation somewhere. All right, Tim Kirchin in Boston. A's at Red Sox coming up at 7 Eastern after the 6 right here on ESPN. Smooth segue, but staying in New England. 0-1 New England at 0-1 New Orleans on Sunday with the Patriots looking to avoid starting 0-2 for the first time since 0-1 and two games under 500 at any point in the season since starting 1-3 on October 13, 2001 when Tom Brady had just taken over from Drew Bledsoe. And Drew Brees was less than a month away from taking his first NFL snap. Mm. Time flies. 38-year-old Brees talked today about he and 40-year-old Brady still having fun and having a lot left. If I can use we in a sentence with me and him, I'd say we probably both have the mindset that we want to change the norm for what is possible in regards to um, how long a guy can play and the level that they can play at. And um, Listen, there's a lot that goes into that. You, know, you build a team around you of people that, that, that continue to help you um, be in the best position to succeed um, in regards to what you do for your diet and your rest habits and your recovery. and your training and, and everything else. All right, Jamel, according to Elias, this will be the first matchup in NFL history. Windians making history. We see history Sunday in NFL history of quarterbacks with 400 career touchdown passes. So something that doesn't come along very often. Both guys, not so great, though, in the openers. Who do you believe in more to bounce back in week two? Well, it, Brady or Breeze? First, is this a must-win? Prettiest win? supermodel. Is this a must-win game? No, Doug Baldwin. <laughs> it's not a must-win game. You know? I just wanted to not check. 0-1, 0-1, oh, one, one, yeah. one, right? Um, I think between the two is, is Tom Brady. It, it, look, the, as great as the Saints offense can be, and despite maybe some awkwardness that's going on or maybe it's not going on between Adrian Peterson and Sean Payton, I mean, the Patriots have a more complete team. Um, and <laughs> The defense didn't look that much better than New Orleans. It did not, but I, I guess between the two, uh, it's hard not to put more faith and trust. And I know Sean Payton is no slouch as a coach, but it's hard not to put more faith and trust into New England. You said something after they lost. Uh, oh, Kansas. you were listening? What I was. I was. I was one of the rare times. Yeah. He said something, and it, it, it took – it rooted in here about New England, about how sometimes coaches almost – they don't love to lose, but they like to l- use losing as such a teachable moment. Mm-hmm. Like, it goes a long way. And I think for New England, they were so disappointed – And I think shell-shocked by how they performed in the opening game that I expect them to be extremely motivated to correct the course against the Saints. Yeah, Tom Brady in particular. You say, you know, you wouldn't like Tom Brady when he's angry, but, you know, that's his secret captain. He's always angry. And he seems truly embarrassed by how they play. But he's always angry. He's always on edge. So I I, I know what you're saying. And not to mention they've had extended preparation time, having started the season on Thursday, to fix a lot of things, whereas the Saints are coming off the short week having played on Monday night. But that said, Saints at home. And the Dome does not mean the home field advantage that it once did. But – it's, if I'm going to pick which of these quarterbacks I think will have a better game, uh, you know, with, with all due respect to Brady, I'm going to go with Breeze because the Patriots' defense just looked devoid of playmakers. And it, and it pains me to say that because i got so much respect for Matt Patricia and Bill Belichick so, and so their you, ability that to fix fixable. problems. That I'm not saying it's not fixable. I just don't know in a week against New Orleans. This ain't right. the get-right game for them. <laughs> I think this is a, a work in progress beyond just an extended week with a Thursday night game. So if I'm looking at which of these quarterbacks, which of these Hall of Fame quarterbacks, gets the better of the other, obviously they're not guarding each other or defending each other, but who has the better game? I'm going with Breeze at home. And again, I told you going into 
into the Monday night game. Adrian Peterson is an afterthought, okay? He is right. not the story in that backfield. Alvin Kamara, he was the primary running back. I, I see a high-scoring game, and I see Alvin Kamara, Kamara being a weapon, that rookie running back out of Now, Tennessee. you're not just saying that because he's on your fantasy team, are you? No, okay, not at all. Of course no. not. And I'm not just saying it because I'm from New Orleans. Uh, no, I grew up in New England, <laughs> practically. As the, as the Texans are figuring out their quarterback situation, looks like they'll have to figure out their linebacker situation, too. The NFL has announced that Brian Cushing has been suspended 10 games without pay for violating the league's policy on performance-enhancing substances. It is the second time Cushing has violated the league's policy, and if he were to receive a third suspension, he would be suspended from the league for at least two years. Now, Cushing was already one of five Texans players in the concussion protocol after getting hurt week one against Jacksonville, all right? Also in the protocol, all three of Houston's tight ends, and Houston has already listed seven players as out for Thursday's week two against Cincinnati. We bring that up because, listen to this, effective immediately, the CFL, Canadian Football League, is banning full contact practice in pads during the season. Teams were previously allotted 17 such practices during the regular season, but those have been eliminated. The CFL will still be allowed full contact practices during training camp, but that's it. Additionally, the league is moving from two to three bye weeks per team each season. Then... The NFL, of course, allows 14 padded practices over a 17-week season with one bye, all right? Now, Georgia Tala, spokesperson for the NFLPA, he tweeted Jamel this afternoon that this is a, quote, interesting development. Is this the future of professional football? Um, I'm not sure about that just yet. Obviously, we've seen the NFL make a lot of changes, and it's been mixed reviews. I mean, there's a lot of coaches that blame maybe the rate of injury, blame the rust, blame the fact that the game isn't always a smooth watch on the fact that they're they're not able to practice as much or practice as physically as mm-hmm. they once did. Now, you can certainly argue, and I think you, you can argue this um, very soundly, that the way the NFL used to do things, that's not necessarily the answer either, that there's got to be a happy medium. I can't remember which college, but I know it's a college that does the same thing in terms of how they're limiting – um, I had it right here. Go ahead. Uh, in terms of how they're limited. Well, the Ivy League is the banned Ivy full League, practice. That's what yeah, it was. Full uh, contact practices. Yeah. That they've banned full contact right, practices. I remember that. I guess I just don't know. Uh, and I don't want to be one of these people uh, that is ignorant to what these players are going through physically. Yeah. But at the same time, there is a part of me that wonders, well, could that be the reason at some points why we do see more injuries? Yeah. And, if they're, and if they're not used to the contact or if they have less time to learn how sure. to tackle appropriately, yeah. what kind of dramatic impact that could have You're on talking the game. and thinking like a coach right now, and that's why a lot of coaches are certainly rolling their eyes at this. And, and right now, and Kevin Seifert points this out on .com, that the NFL CBA, it limits teams to 14 padded practices during the season, 11 coming in the first 11 weeks of the season, though teams are not required to use them all, and some actually don't. So we've already seen an evolution as it relates right. to contact, both in the offseason and during the season, and that frustrates coaches to no end, because they're like, how am I supposed to prepare a person to play football, be a physical football team, and we can't be physical in practice? That's an old-school mentality mentality that's going to have to evolve so to answer my own question is this the future professional football in north america yes i absolutely believe it is or else football is going to go away permanently if it's going to stick around long term i'm not talking about five years i'm not talking about 10 years i'm talking about long term it's going to have to make extreme evolutionary steps to truly take care of the players you can't just give lip service right. to player safety and not say this is there's a reason why georgia tyler tweeted that there's a reason why he said this is interesting because it's something that they have got to consider and even more, even moving forward, they got to consider whether they're playing too many games. Yeah. You know, whether, whether they need to go back to 14 or 12 games. I think all of that's on the table if you're going to preserve the health of the players like you claim to want to do. Well, but is there room for a little more compromise in terms of the evolution? Because the other part of this, OK, it can evolve into what the CFL is doing and maybe even go to where the Ivy League is going. But then if it makes the product worse, then I how think that's does that on those same consumer? coaches that's rooted in their set in their ways. Those same coaches, it's a challenge. But you got to figure out how to coach them up, how to figure out how, how, to, how to teach guys how to tackle, how to perform without having in-season padded practices. It sounds impossible, but the alternative is to keep beating people up and beating up these guys' bodies. And the players, that's yet another thing. But now they don't have to wait to the CBA to right. negotiate these changes. It's health and safety. But that's another thing that when you're talking about drawing a line in certain places, it's not just money. It's not just Roger Goodell's autonomy. It's got to be your own protection as well. Mm. All right, Russell Westbrook, speaking of money, signed a 10-year extension with Jordan Brand through as long as the 2025-2026 NBA season. The deal will also include both on- and off-court signature sneakers. 
and is the most lucrative endorsement deal for a Jordan athlete to date. Yours truly, as you know, has got the sweetest deal for members of the media, but I digress. <laughs> Today on The Jump, Ramona Shelburne talked about the available extension with the Thunder that Russ has yet to sign. He's willing to commit to Jordan, but not to the Thunder? Oh, sorry. Why you gotta be like that? Why you gotta I gotta be like that. Because that is, why I'm telling you right now, like, that is the uh, story in the NBA. Like, course. everyone you call mm -hmm. is saying, why hasn't Russell Westbrook signed that extension? Well. Something to be concerned? Yes, they should be concerned. Why? And, look, I, I know what, I know Russell, especially once Kate, Kevin Durant left, he has been positioned and depicted as the hero. He's the guy who stays. He sticks out the commitment. But much like a lot of players are doing these days, despite the fact, uh, and understand these are not two mutually exclusive things. He could leave the Thunder and still love everything that he uh, accomplished there, love the fans, love the city. But he would be doing himself a disservice if he did not look around and take his time in thinking about this, regardless of whatever emotional connections remain there for him in OKC. This is not about, and I know, especially in markets like OKC, they, they tend to take, uh, the fans tend to take, uh, take these things personally. But this is today's NBA. Players are all about putting themselves in the best position to win. It's not necessarily about loyalty to city mm -hmm. or to team. It is right. about loyalty to can I win. And you know how Russell Westbrook plays. There's no half speed for him. He wants to be in a position to win. Not saying it can't be Oklahoma. Well, but I don't, that's the thing. I don't blame him for looking around. But that's the thing. You look around and there's a lot of green on the table. But tell me where the grass is truly greener on the other side well, from a competitive know. standpoint. What if, him and Russ, what if him and LeBron go to L.A.? No, it's possible. And maybe he wants to keep his options open. But I don't think the Thunder could be concerned, should be concerned about the fact that he hasn't sign the extension because it's not going anywhere and he's not going anywhere in the short term because if you're Sam Preston, your organiza that organization, you know that you've done everything possible to make Oklahoma City viable for Russell Westbrook to win. Nobody Nobody outside of Sam Presley's office saw him pulling a rabbit out of his hat on a trade with the trade of Paul George. Yeah, nobody saw Kevin Durant leaving either. But here's the thing: Kevin Durant didn't leave because he couldn't win in Oklahoma City. And I knew you were going to bring up Kevin Durant, which is why I'm ready to go in on that. Because I and many others had an issue with Kevin Durant leaving, not because of a player taking the control of his destiny and deciding he wanted something better for himself. It was the notion that he could not get it done in OKC. And there's a, a, a subtle yet distinct difference between can't and didn't. They didn't get it done in OKC for a variety of reasons, but it certainly weren't for lack of mismanagement. And as I've always said, it goes management, money, marketing, if you're really about winning. For some guys, it's money, uh, management, market. Okay, right. So I don't buy this idea that Russ has eyes on L.A. How many years we've been talking about Russ having eyes on L.A.? But it's a different L.A. This is not the same L.A. We don't know from what it is. They got a lot of buzz around. They, they got young talent. We know they talent. have a blueprint Paul now. Paul George may be ticketed for there. And they have there. credibility now. In sure. terms of, so we know that. We know their management is finally in order. And look, I never bought into the fact that Russell Westbrook wanted to go to L.A. just because he loves fashion and he wants to be in a bigger market. As Correct. you know, and LeBron has proven, the players create the market wherever they are. I think this is truly depending on what other basketball conversations and text messages are taking place because we sure. know all these players are recruiting each other. All right. I think he's going to look at the situation and L.A. may very well be one I'll, of those situations. I also think this Jordan brand extension, their, their whole their whole marketing campaign and I know people have broken their word before, but their whole sure marketing has. campaign has been about people staying, okay, and, and, and taking subtle shots at Kevin Durant for leaving. I can't see him being two-faced in that regard and pointing the finger at somebody else and calling him a cupcake and then pulling something, something of a but similar act, not quite the same thing. this would be different. A little that, different, yeah. Russell, your deal different. is up. You're a free agent. You can Bottom line is this. Most people can't explain want. Russell Westbrook's shot selection or his shirt selection. His decision not to sign it, only Russ knows that, and I don't think we can get inside that guy's head. All right, let's take it or leave it, Jamel. The New York Post's page six spies Ooh. report that Odell Beckham and Russell Westbrook had a dance battle. Hope it was to beat it. Last Wednesday, <laughs> well, no, Wyclef performed. Maybe he did perform. Beat it. Of course, Odell set out week one with that high ankle sprain. Take it or leave it, that's a bad look for Odell. I'm going to leave it. Allegedly. Allegedly. Unless this, if people are saying it's a bad look, uh, because they feel like somehow he could re-injure it or this could have some impact on his availability. That's just ridiculous. Unless this was like the house party dance-off where he's flipping over his leg or something crazy, mm -hmm. I don't understand why this is a story. All right, I'm going to leave it too because I refuse to do the Miami boat thing again. All right. right. Like, <laughs> right. People have talked about how much this young man loves to practice. 
if he were able to practice, he would have played. He tried to go before the game. Anybody that believes that a dance battle, okay, is, is, as intricate as these dances are with these kids nowadays, right. that a dance battle versus going out there, running, cutting, taking hits is the same thing, you don't, this doesn't even deserve the time we just gave it. So let's go ahead and move on. All right. Uh, I can't tell if Hugh Jackson was just trolling us, but in his news conference today, the Browns coach called Joe Flacco one of the elite quarterbacks no, in this no, league. Mike, take it or leave it. <laughs> I'm going to take it. No, take it. I'm going to take it. Really? You got to consider the messenger. He used to coach Joe Flacco. Yeah, well, he used to coach Joe Flacco. Also make him biased? Exactly. Oh, okay. That's I'm taking it right. in context. Oh, I'm taking it. You understand? I'm, I'm having there. it both ways right now. Okay. And now here's the thing. You, he may not be elite as we define it, but how many people got one of them things? Right. How many active quarterbacks got, got one of those? He had an elite postseason run. <laughs> yeah, he okay, did. so you know what? I'll take a ring over whether Michael or Jamel thinks I'm elite any day, so I'm going to take this. Okay, so you know how you often call e I I'm leaving this, by the way. You yeah. know how you often call Eli Manning? He has a Hall of I Fame say, resume. Yeah, but not a Hall of Fame but player. But not a, a Hall of Fame player. Right. Flacco, to me, fits that bill. I don't even know if he has a Hall of Fame resume. No, not just with a Hall of Fame, but in terms of, like, he's a good quarterback. I don't think he's a great quarterback. I think he's perfect for this organization. Okay? Yeah. And he's, and you're right, you can't take anything away from him for his money Hugh or his Jackson rank. Jackson is loyal to the guys that he has coached. I'm loyal to the process. ESPN.com's infamous NBA rankings <laughs> have Joel Embiid, Ranked ahead of all NBA, was he second or third team, Isaiah Thomas? All NBA, <laughs> Isaiah Thomas. Okay. Take it or leave it. Uh, I gotta leave it's this. What? I gotta leave this, Mike. And you know, I need I, you to talk with your head, not your heart, right I, now. I love him, B, right? But I do think the player that Isaiah Thomas was last season was a better player than who ah, ah, Embiid was. This is was. projections. This is okay. projections for this year coming up. All right. Well, look, I'll say this: even projecting going forward. I know where everybody wants Embiid to be, and he will probably be that, but I got to give Isaiah a little bit more. It's no disrespect to be behind Joel Embiid. Respect that. It's no disrespect to say you're worse than me. It's just something <laughs> they just are. They just are, which is not saying much, by the way. Joel Embiid, do you know that the Sixers' defense was number one in the league with him on the court? I'm taking this. Is it not obvious that I'm taking this? What Clearly. Put my pick. Put it on the screen. Of course I'm taking this. All things process I take. This guy, if healthy, has the opportunity to be a future Hall of Fame player. He has that kind of potential. He can be a perennial all-star. And he's got a better supporting cast? What's the thing about Isaiah? Love him. Health. Defense. Defense. Got you, got that. you got help with Embiid. Bad luck. Not defense. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm -hmm. <laughs> and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Yo, what up, y'all, man? There's no way I can let another day go by without shouting out the home team Cleveland Indians 21 game winning streak what y'all doing right now keep it going i was about to say it's incredible but i want to i want to come back and do another video when y'all got like a 40 game winning streak no pressure no pressure i get it i've had my own 27 game winning streak in the nba before it's a lot of pressure winning every night man but what y'all doing inspiring the youth showing you know the rest of the mlb what it's about man to come back after a, a devastating loss you know what i'm saying in the in the um, in, the, in the championship rounds, man. So, you know, big shout out, man, for y'all to come back the way y'all playing right now from what happened in the World Series. So commendable. Keep it going. Cleveland Pride, man, the land, the Cleveland Windians is what y'all name gonna be soon. So, you might want to trade. I might want to trademark that so I can sell a couple T-shirts or some. Put uh, Francisco Lindor, uh, Lindor's name on it. Hey, Cisco. I need one of those jerseys ASAP. But, uh, nah, man, for real, congratulations, man. Y'all keep going, all right? And uh, I'll be to the ballpark and see y'all soon, uninterrupted. Does LeBron's enthusiasm about the Indians mean he's more likely to stay or go? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Shout out to uninterrupted. Is anybody going to interrupt the Cleveland Indians winning streak up to 21 games after today's 5-3 to three win over Detroit? Get this. Cleveland starters during this streak have gone 19-0 with a 1-7-0 ERA, while the Indians have outscored opponents 139-35. to 
Maybe the biggest development of this game today is that they actually fell behind. <laughs> one nothing in the first, but they came back, took a 3-1 lead on a 3-run homer by Jay Bruce in the bottom half of the inning, and that is all she wrote. Here's Terry Francona. You know, I'm curious what you think, whether the 26-game win streak without a tie, the 1916 Giants is the record, or the 1935 Cubs, the 21 streak. What do you consider the streak? I wasn't there. I know. <laughs> you know, I, I have given that zero thought. I promise you I've given it no thought. And Eduardo Perez, we hear that. Have you given it thought? <laughs> I, I wasn't there also. <laughs> I mean, Frank Kona says they haven't given it any thought. The players have been pretty relaxed about it. But from a player's res- perspective, when you have a 21-game win streak, and LeBron kind of alluded to this a minute ago, the pressure seems to build every night in terms of the expectation of you uh, to win. So how do you as a player, how does a win streak this large of this magnitude, how does that kind of infect your mind a little bit? You know what's interesting about the Cleveland Indians? As a player, you think, okay, if you put a little pressure on yourself, there are other players that are coming up to bat, and they are doing it for you. It's been a different hero, it seems, in Cleveland. Every night, and you look at the pitching, the pitching has been there. It's been strong. Everybody thought as soon as Andrew Miller went down in, in, in August, August 21st, against the Red Sox that this team was going to go down. They lost two straight games, and then after that, they haven't looked back, and it's because of their pitching. It's been there from the get-go, and it's allowed their hitters to continue not only to hit home runs, to take the extra bases from first to third, to have the timely hitting, and as we see right there, Mr. Perez going straight away center, you can't I mean, you can't call this. This yeah. is a different hero every night. It's not just Francisco Lindor. It's not just the Ramirez. It's everyone putting in their two cents into this team. Yeah, it Eduardo, seems like the pressure is working in a good way for them. Exactly. Eduardo, to quote Joe Clark from Lean On Me, <laughs> or paraphrase, I should say, the Indians don't fool around with it. They do it expeditiously. I say that to say that the Indians have outscored their opponents. Check this out, Eduardo. 64 to 12 in the first three innings during their winning streak, right? So, spinning this forward, though, the 17 starting pitchers they're likely to face the rest of the season have combined for a 4.87 ERA this season, scheduled to face one starter with an ERA below four, and is scheduled to face six starters with an ERA over five. All that's to ask you this, recognizing the randomness of this game and that this streak can end at any point for any, any reason, how long do you think they can take this thing? I think they can take it until they clinch. Let's put it that way. Magic number right now is four. So you look at what the, the Minnesota Twins do tonight. They could go down to three. If they clinch, they win. I think their starters overall will get that day off, and this is where a Kansas City Royal team that will play them this weekend I think will probably get a win. I think that will be good for the Cleveland Indians so they can focus now on trying to get the best record in that American League, sustain it, and be able to have that home field advantage. So I I see it that way, the way that the Indians have played. I think you need to give those stars a rest. And if you lose, so be it. The bottom line is you have to get back to the World Series and this time not just be the bridesmaid but win it. All right, Eduardo, we appreciate it. We'll see you at the top of the hour for Red Sox A's. You got it. All right, with all due respect to Mayweather McGregor, the real fight of the year is Triple G Canelo. Here's SportsCenter All Access. This is the biggest boxing match of the year. It is Canelo Alvarez versus Gennady Golovkin. It's a special fight. This is two great champions. It's war. It's not comedy fight. No, es una pelea que ellos pedían, que ellos querían. Eh, va a ser una pelea muy, muy interesante, competitiva y que la van a disfrutar ellos. How's the press tour been going? It's very busy. started at ESPN campus. We had probably did like five miles going all around there yeah. yesterday. Up and down the stairs, it was nuts. Our next guests are part of arguably the biggest fight of the year. 
He is the biggest money fighter in boxing right now. Do you need to knock him out to win? If I have chance, I did it. He's chance, he did it. We have Canelo and Triple G in studio. Are you coming out perfect, or is he coming out with another name on the wall? I don't know. I'm not God. Yo creo que no va a llegar a la distancia. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us on Sports Center. Canelo Alvarez, Triple G, Oscar De La Hoya in the house with Stephen A. I will be in attendance for this one. I have no doubt that both of y'all are going to show up ready to rumble. Just seeing all of y'all, man. It is in the neighborhood, man. First off, welcome to the neighborhood, my brother. Thank you very much. Now, you have a twin brother? Yeah. And yeah. that's your hey. twin brother. Yeah. It's my hey. twin brother. Mm. Can he fight? Yes. I'll talk about I'm not messing with him either. Do you love all the things that come with a big fight like this? Right now, this is my job. Gracias a Dios, ya terminamos hoy, pero tuvo. Tuvo poquito pesada, más que nada por los vuelos, pero de pues, modo es parte del trabajo y hay que hay que asumirlo. It's finally here, September 16th, the middleweight super fight between Canelo Álvarez and Gennady Golovkin. Yo, I wish I could have been at Murray State practice to watch Bishop Woods get married. You promised to have a solid answer for what are you thinking about at least 50% of the time. You promise to share in her joys, relish in her success, help bear her struggles, and defend her causes. You promise to remember that he's a funny, smart man that has friends that love him and want his time as attention. You promise to remember that he chose to spend his life with you, and he chooses to share his heart with you, and he chooses to build a future with you. Thank you. By the power invested in me by the Universal Life Church Ministries and Murray State Football, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Considerable wedding spots man. these days. Ah, that's beautiful, man. I'm not mad at them. That's beautiful. That's real love. That, that's what that's that union's gonna last. Now you uh God is joined together, may no man put us under. I'm sorry. That's my ministry days coming out. You know, I, I got say, uncle, grandfather, you, pastors. You, I married my brother in law. Yes, exactly. I did. Well, did it might have been Universal Life Church ministries. <laughs> I still may be an ordained minister, hint hint. That's kind of scary. Hint hint. <laughs> That's kind of scary. <laughs> Thanks. The vows were the best part, though. Yeah. Promises to have an answer for what are you thinking? And we had to edit it for time. He's like, promise to know what you want to eat when he asks. The, that, the that's offensive line coach Brian Hamilton, the real genius here, right and trademark you these know, I reject that. Men think that women don't know what we want to eat. I don't understand this. No, you know what you want to eat. You want to order something and you want to eat off of my plate, too. What's wrong with that? Congratulations. Caitlin Myers is the beautiful bride. Speaking of congratulations, congratulations to Jonas Stillman, the 18-year-old the Vikings hired to serve as a Gen Z advisor hmm. to help them better connect with their young fan base. See, we better be careful putting him in doing too much because he may be running a team one day and we may be looking to him for information. That's an awesome gig, but you know the best way to connect with your young fan base? Sam Bradford connecting with Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen, Kyle Rudolph. You mean to win? Cook. It's That's just that I'm simple? Saying. That's all I'm saying. Young people like winners. I'm hating. I'm not young. I don't know why. Oh, why? Because you didn't have a job that right. great. <laughs> exactly. So Steve Smith is no longer playing football for his job. And one day he's going to be a Hall of Famer. But he got this little five-year window that he's got to wait for. But come to find out, of the 108 Modern Era nominees, Steve Smith is one of them. But not that Steve Smith. It's the one that played with the Giants. Ooh. Back in the day, he was That's pretty me. good. Yeah. Boy, he was pretty good for a second. Not how and, playing, oh, and more important, he went to USC. Thank you, Jasmine. He went to USC. So, <laughs> not, not quite a Hall of Famer, famer right. but yeah, he was pretty good. So, we, jumping the gun a little bit. Why the Hall of Fame can't get it together? Well, we got it together. Remember Steve Smith Sr.? He's in our Hall of Fame. He is He's in, in the DTM Hall, Hall of Fame. Fame. And I think that's all that matters. Exactly. Like, forget about the jacket. We're what matters. Uh, all right, ESPN's NBA rankings continue to stir up a lot of emotions um, from current players. CJ McCollum tweeted, we need to start ranking these journalists I'm here for with this. descriptions of their strengths, weaknesses, and ability to make up quote-unquote sources. I, I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm here for this. Really? I, matter of fact, open invitation to CJ if you're free. I know you're kind of dabbling in the media. You're welcome to come and do it because I'm confident in the way I'm going to land. I, I did my top five. Did, did you? you do a top five? I did not. You were a little busy today. It goes <laughs> Dylon. No, it goes me, me, this is a hard one. Me, me, 
And then sneaking in at number five, yours truly. See? Absolutely. I can tell you my strength. I, they are no weaknesses, so I can just spend no, no, this no, time no, talking some strength. Weaknesses. Beer game is impeccable. No. Caroline. No, no. Diction. Look, grammar. And y'all the video. Takes athleticism. No, that's I not beat athletic. Chris Johnson in a 40-yard dash. With a 900-yard head start. Would you trust the journalist that. that did that? Hey, I can, Would I, you trust a journalist? I seize the moment is what I do. <laughs> that's what I do. Would you trust that's somebody what I'm here for. who did a hybrid soldier boy? energy. Slash, I don't know charisma, what that is. Knowledge. Nah, connection. that's not charisma, Mike. Did I mention looks? Come on, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. Top five, dead or alive, right here. <laughs> I don't you know where you at on the list. You're a shameless. You dropped about a day. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a great day by myself. I, Tell the people who had I a good day. I had a great day. Tell the people who else had a good day. <laughs> All right. Of course, Serena Williams, she had a great day. She introduced the world to her baby girl, Alexis Olympia. Ohanian Jr. Can a little girl be a junior? Uh, it's, it's Serena. She's oh, yeah, beautiful. so who cares? Um, so she says she was born September 1st, weighs 6 pounds, 14 ounces. Hope we'll see that 6 onesie on her at some point. Awesome. I think once upon a time, Serena was on Law & Order. SVU. She was, SVU. Isaiah Thomas, let me show my man some love. He tweeted about being in an upcoming Law & Order episode. And a fan tweeted at him, so you went to Cleveland to make TV shows? Because that's people do they hate. And he replied, yep, and win a championship. I would contend that if you met Mariska Hargitay, my man, you have already won a championship. Hi, Mariska. The City Double Cash Card presents tips for cheering on your kids. Number nine, be supportive. Hey, son, stay focused on everything I'm shouting. You heard your father. Encouraging words filled with pressure. <laughs> Go get them. We love you, buddy. There it is. Wouldn't it be great if everyone said what they meant? The City Double Cash Card does. It lets you earn double cash back with 1% when you buy and 1% as you pay. The City Double Cash Card. Double means double. There's still this sentiment that it's Golden State's world and everybody else is just living in it. What do you say to that? Well, don't get me wrong, they're, they're very, very talented. You know, they're talented, but they're beatable. What's good? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. That's right, the beard's going to be in the building. We'll talk to the face of the Rockets, an NBA Live's cover guy about helping Houston heal after Harvey and what he's picking up from those all-star pickup games this summer. We've also got Kobe and KD news in September. But first, the Indians going for 20, the Dodgers going the wrong way, Melo going at us, get in line, and Deshaun <laughs> Watson looking like... He's going to start Thursday night, Jamel. Yeah, let's begin there. So he reportedly took all the snaps with the first team offense, at least with what uh, the media saw, which comes, of course, after he replaced Tom Savage for poor performance on Sunday. This, of course, led to questions for Bill O'Brien about who will start for the Texans on Thursday against the Bengals. Prepare yourself for some breaking news. Any decision by your shirt? No. What are you still evaluating going through? A lot of things. Does Sean's health play a role in the decision or is that not? The health of any player is the first determining whether they play or not. Do you anticipate like a game time decision? Maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's a rule that says I have to publicly announce it. So, Way to let us in, Bill O'Brien, but is it a no-brainer to start Deshaun Watson? I don't think so. Um, from where I sit, and obviously I'm not charged with making a decision, that's why he's the head coach and I'm a talking head, but from where I sit, it feels like a panic move because if you were going to start Deshaun Watson and abandon your plan to get him all the way ready before you started him, if you were going to start him this soon in the season, then you should have just started him from Jump Street. So there was a reason why they felt like, even though they traded up to get him, they want to go with Tom Savage at the beginning of the year and then see how the year plays out while Deshaun continued to get ready. So after a bad game against a really good Jaguars defense where your offensive line is minus Dwayne Brown, maybe this is a cry to pay Dwayne Brown to get him in-house, to go to Deshaun Watson, healthy or not, it just feels too soon. He may give them, Bill O'Brien may feel like Deshaun Watson gives them the best chance to win on Thursday night. I got that. But for me, you don't evaluate this situation after a game, one bad game and then say, okay, Let's go to the rookie who we plan to sit. To me, start Tom Savage. If he struggles again, you turn it to Sean and let him move forward with the extended week after the Thursday night game. But to do it on a short week 
after you played him in relief, it just feels hurried to me. Well, I was surprised to be to begin with that Deshaun Watson wasn't the starter from where it go. But just based off everything I read and even uh, looking between the tea leaves of some of the comments that Bill O'Brien made about Deshaun Watson in the preseason in camp, that this wasn't so much about Tom Savage just winning the job and impressing him and bowling them over. It's about it was development. A, it was about development and about the fact that Deshaun Watson wasn't the sharpest during preseason, that at times he looked a little bit iffy. But I never got this sense that this was that much distance between them in terms of who was the better player. Well, you're right. In fairness, when you start Tom Savage under those circumstances, there is something to be said for. Did you evaluate him under the ultimate circumstances in the best possible position? But I think there's also something to be said, which is widely known in NFL circles when it comes to quarterback. If you're a younger player and the other quarterback, the more veteran quarterback, mm-hmm. are, like, are basically this. That's any position. Then just go with the younger then guy. Then go with that to begin with. That's all I'm saying. Like, if you had a plan in place, you don't abandon it this soon. There was a reason why you didn't start Deshaun from jump. If Deshaun Watson gives you the better chance to win, is the better player for this team, and has the upside, you should have known that before week one. It shouldn't have taken the Jaguars getting 10 sacks for you to know Well, that. if they do wind up going with Deshaun Watson on Thursday, I think they need to stick with that the rest and of the I season. And I think he'll be fine. Yeah. He's got the makeup to be able to handle, even if he gets hit and, and struggles, he can handle it going forward. All right, get your fresh power rankings right here, people. Uh, The Week 2 rankings are out, and the Steelers are number one, followed by the Packers and Chiefs. New England is still fourth. The Eagles and Lions are your new entries into the top ten. So, How are the Patriots ahead of the Raiders, the Falcons, and the Cowboys? You read my mind. You read my mind. So we're still giving them this much respect after what we just saw. And that's not to say one week makes a season, Mike. We know Mm -hmm. that. And we know the Patriots will get better. But these are week to week. Right. And in this week, the Patriots are not the fourth best team in the NFL. I used to be one of the power rankings voters in another life. Back when I was an NFL reporter here, and I hated power rankings because there was just there was no rhyme or reason as to why one team was ranked higher than another. It's good fodder. It's it's low hanging fruit. It's it's good for discussion. And look, look, you, you know, after. Last Thursday night, I said, do not panic about the Patriots because their body of work mm-hmm. suggests that they deserve the benefit of the doubt when it comes to slow starts and figuring it out. But if we're talking about just week one, just in the moment, they deserve to be even how, even with that body of work, even with the best head coach and quarterback of all time. They deserve to be outside the top 10, if not in the bottom half of teams in the league with how they looked against Kansas City. And I think Kansas, not how we think they're going to look, right, but how, how they, they look, look right, right now. now. Exactly. Okay, and Oakland just beat Tennessee. And they should be Are ahead they still of holding 28 to 3 against Atlanta? <laughs> how is Atlanta after New England? Well, I can understand. And maybe, I can't believe I'm this wrapped up in power <laughs> And maybe this is about uh, the Bears not looking uh, – the Bears looking better than people expected and, and there being low expectation for them and people expecting Atlanta to have done more against the Bears. It could be some of that. All right, I'll give you that. But the Chiefs, to me, should have been in the top spot, and hopefully they weren't. Oh, so this is about Pittsburgh being number one. The Chiefs should – they were number three. They right. should have been number it's one. It's about either. the Patriots being number four, and yeah. to me, the Chiefs had every right to be in, in the top position because, all right, if we are considering resume, you're talking about the defending Super Bowl champions on opening night – Alex Smith playing in a way we've never seen him play before. Mm -hmm. And everything that they did to minimize what was supposed to be a Patriots team that a lot of people were uh, putting in an undefeated conversation. There's something to be said for that. Now, we both are kind of definitely should be. We both are kind of splitting hairs just a little bit. Like we actually making up a football conversation all. (laughs) Don't don't let them in on that. (laughs) To be completely transparent, because we both believe that the Patriots will end up at or near the top by the end of the season. But if you're just talking about right now, that's a little too much respect in the moment. You're allowed to be a prisoner in the moment for power rankings purposes. Uh, Understand what we're witnessing in Cleveland. The Indians plus 100 run differential during their 19 game winning streak is the best by any team during any 19 game span since the 39 Yankees and that run differential is already greater than the run differential during any of the three longer streaks since 19 and with the win at home tonight against the Tigers behind Corey Kluber, the Tribe will become the fourth team in the modern era with a 20-game winning streak. Pedro Gomez has been following the Tribe for the last couple of days. Pedro, do the players understand the magnitude of what they're accomplishing right now? And Michael, that stat you threw out is fantastic. Here's my favorite one during the streak. This streak is 171 innings long. The Indians have trailed in four innings. Come on now. Four. Think about that for a minute. Try to wrap your mind around that alone. You know what, though? In terms (laughs) terms of what you asked, though, 
you know, I asked Trevor Bauer about that, and Bauer said, look, last year we had a 14-game winning streak, and that was about proving to people how good we were. This year, during this streak, we're not trying to prove anything to anybody because we know how good we are. Francisco Lindor, who arguably could be the best all-around player in the game right now, was asked that same question before tonight's game, and his answer was interesting. He said, I love what we're doing. I love 19 wins in a row. If we get 20, 21, whatever, but nothing, nothing will compare to playing in the World Series, and I want to get back there again. So as much as they understand what's going on, it's not the greater good, really, that they're thinking about. They're thinking about October baseball and what they can do. And listen, this is a club that now, in the course of the last three weeks, has jumped over the Astros, something that seemed inconceivable for the best record in the American League. It's not inconceivable to think that they could jump over the Dodgers for best record in all of baseball and secure home field throughout October. Unbelievable, yeah. You wonder when this winning streak is going to end. Pedro, thanks a lot. Get comfortable. You may be in for a few more games <laughs> before you can leave tribe duty. Thanks a lot for joining us. Now, speaking of the Dodgers, I imagine the only thing worse than losing an 11th game in a row is doing it after 2 o'clock in the morning. When it rains, it pours, literally. So tonight against the Giants, the Dodgers turn to Clayton Kershaw to end that 11-game losing streak, which would still only mean they'd won two of their last 18. They're in the midst of their worst losing streak and 17-game stretch since 1944 when they were still in Brooklyn. And Buster only says, Jamel, that we may be watching the greatest collapse in baseball history considering where the Dodgers were to where they are. So which is more mind-blowing, the Indian streak or the Dodgers skid? It's the Dodgers skid. And I know that normally because of it's such a long season in baseball, and we do this in the NBA too, where you try to take the regular season, it means something, but try to make sure it doesn't mean everything. Just like Pedro was saying a second ago, ultimately what matters is winning the World Series. Are you ready once the postseason begins? But I'm sorry, the fact that who would have guessed that in September the Dodgers would have just as many wins as the Rams, right? <laughs> who would have also one guessed? One way of looking at I it. I mean, who would have also guessed that since August 23rd, the Dodgers would have only won three games? Yeah. And all, all skids, all downturns, all losing streaks are not created equal. And I realize, again, players get bored, all right? I know it's Too not, big of a lead, maybe? I don't know if this is too big of a league because if that you, they had, I mean, oh, yeah. is that, is that what happened? Like they relaxed or something like yeah, that. Or just, I don't know if it's just about that. At first, I was totally willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, this is about them relaxing. It's a long season. But now, just given how their pitching has fallen apart, even look at Kershaw's last outing, which wasn't very good. Right. The bats have gone cold. Like, it's a lot happening with this well, team. Well, I, I think the current winning, excuse me, the current losing streak ends tonight. I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I don't think Clayton Kershaw goes three and two thirds tonight. All right. I, I think he, he stops the streak. As for the overall skid, this funk just feels a little fluky to me. It doesn't mm. feel like who the Dodgers really are. There are reasons behind it. The starting pitching's been bad. The bullpen's been bad. Everybody's been bad. That's right. what I was saying. Seager's been out. So I don't think that's who they truly are. I also reject the idea that it's always World Series or bust. I think you can stop and, and appreciate what somebody's doing in the regular season and still celebrate it, to which is why, point. to a point, which, I, I, look, I know nobody's going to look back at Cleveland's winning streak if they don't win the World Series this time around and say, you remember that 19, 20-game winning streak? Or maybe the next time somebody do it, they'll be the Athletics, because that's what, that's what we're celebrating with Oakland right now right. is the last team to do it. But keep in mind, other than Oakland's winning streak, the last 19-game winning streak we saw was in 1949. And just to add some more numbers, I mean, they're hitting 309 as a team. They've homered 38 times and allowed 32 runs during this streak. So for me, I'm wondering when it's going to end. Obviously, it can end tonight behind Corey Kluber, who's been amazing since he came off the DL. But nonetheless, this thing could get into the mid-20s and set an all-time record. So we can stop with the World Series for the time being and appreciate the fact that this team, as Pedro pointed out, trailing for four innings? Yeah. That's unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Interesting that we now turn to Golden State, <laughs> given the conversation we had when they broke the single season record. They stay winning today. The Golden State Warriors announced a three-year jersey sponsorship deal with the Japanese tech company Rakuten, which Darren Ravel reports is worth $20 million per year. The Warriors were on hand to unveil the new sponsorship today, uh, which provided an easy opportunity for Draymond Green to weigh in on the Kyrie Irving trade. He put so much pressure on himself by doing that. But the willingness to do that, knowing the pressure that comes with that and saying, I'm ready to do it, let's do it. You know, most, a lot of people would say LeBron's the greatest player in the world. It's saying, and it's, like, I don't say this in disrespect to LeBron, but in speaking to Kyrie to say, I don't want to play with him no more. I want my own thing. Right. Because you have to deliver with that. Right. And he's, he's basically he's saying, to put okay, a target yeah, on. yeah, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to deliver. And that's, I mean, that's big. That says a lot. See, Draymond, we're here. 
Hmm. Get him here. We're here. Get him here. What is it about Michigan State people and missing the point? (laughs) Because it was never, for me and others who questioned Kyrie's motivation, it was never about him not believing in himself or wanting more for himself. It was about an antiquated, my team, I want to be the guy mentality, which even he downplayed. Because at maybe press conference, it he wasn't was like, about that. Yeah, he was like, one guy can't carry it. So let's not overstate the bet that he made. He may have bet on himself, but he still got Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, mm. Brad Stevens, and a very talented Boston team. He's not exactly going – he's not going to start from the bottom and try to get back here, okay? My issue from the beginning was the rationale as to why he wanted out. Because it is so 2001 – or 2007, not 2017, to want to be the man. In 2017, what's hot in these NBA streets is what can I do to put myself in position to get to the finals, which he's been to three straight years, thanks to that dude. So no matter what kind of personality clashes you, you are as high maintenance as they come. <laughs> Let's just put it out there. Me, yes, I'm the one. All the drama I got to deal with today on account of your behind, <laughs> on account of you, <laughs> all right? All right? That's, but you know what? You're worth it. You're worth it. <laughs> I love how you flipped that around. You got off the field issues. Okay? <laughs> right. Okay, you're a distraction from time to time. Mm-hmm. I need but, to mature. But I wouldn't trade you for nobody. <laughs> because I know where you and I are going. Because here we are, right here. <laughs> Same thing is what right. I'm getting at. It's like I, I just had an issue with, and again, I, I respect Kyrie wanting to grow and evolve in his own way. He did. My only issue was the idea of really what more could you, you want to be the first person organization calls, I guess, but when you're going to the finals and hitting historically great but, shot, but, you're winning. That's all it was for Mike, me. You're winning than and your shoes it's are selling. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than Nino Brown. Go ahead, Miss Hawkins. Go ahead. <laughs> it's bigger than Nino Brown because it, it, maybe it wasn't specifically about being the man because given the team that he's Seems like through, it was about LeBron. It was not just, a, it was about LeBron in the sense of, I think Kyrie just wanted control of his own destiny. But he didn't have it, and that's the part that okay, Draymond got because he wasn't a free agent. He wasn't a free agent, but nevertheless, if he doesn't put it out there that he wants to be traded, they never get to this point. Did we okay? ever establish why he reportedly asked for a trade after they won the finals? Because That again, was the part that still but here's confuses the thing, though, me. Here's the thing, though, and we've seen this. When, when LeBron leaves, as Miami found out and as Cleveland found out the first time, it takes a lot to piece things back together. Sure. And maybe, again, his strategy was, I'm going to get out or at least put it out there. Before That's LeBron a bold strategy, his, Cotton. It may not it work worked. out if they don't. It worked it because worked. they traded you to Boston. Okay. They could have traded you Results anywhere. Are all and again, matters. this wasn't about LeBron leaving. Uh, which one is it? Was it about him or LeBron possibly leaving and what he would leave behind? Again, when he supposedly considered asking for considered asking for a trade after the finals victory. That says something about what he or wanted. Or maybe he just knew coming down the pike that LeBron wasn't going to be there, and he didn't want to get stuck holding the bag. Stay woke, or I might have to trade you. <laughs> ESPN.com's top 100 NBA players sure. projects Carmelo Anthony as the 64th best player for this coming season. Ahead of Marcus Smart and behind Lonzo Ball, mind you. Based in part on the 2017-18 projected RPM of negative .15. So Melo took notice. I really wish he hadn't. <laughs> okay. I really wish he hadn't because you know look, I blame Melo for. See, I get it, man. I get it. But this a mission accomplished. That was with, pretty Melo that with, put that. With out. all due respect to my esteemed colleagues, this what this was for. It's for attention. Mm-hmm. It was it was clickbait. It was to get somebody talking. Like ain't no way in hell Carmelo Anthony is a 64th best player going into this season. I know. So I blame Melo for dignifying this nonsense with a response. <laughs> Number one, don't feed the trolls. Number two, you got to wait that no trade clause for somebody else, man. Because as long as you are playing meaningless basketball right. in the Mecca, that you're gonna be, your reputation is going to suffer by association. And, this, and that is partly why he got that ranking. And look, I'm as hard, you know this, Mike, I'm as hard as, Car, hard as on Carmelo as anybody. And uh-huh. even I think that is ridiculous. 64? 64. Like, behind okay. a dude that they never played? Maybe he's not top five anymore. Maybe he's not top ten anymore. I'm safe you, to say that. Okay, right. But 15 to 20? Come on. And like, I don't even know if I put it 15 to 20. Okay. 64 behind a dude that's never played in the NBA. That's just wrong. This It's wrong that we're actually talking about it. So now we didn't made the news because the player has responded. That's what I hate. Well, I mean, ESPN has made the news because the player but responded. But if you think about it, well, here's the upside of that. And I think a lot of people have taken notice. Uh, that's why the whole hoodie mellow thing has become a thing. Mm-hmm. It's because they feel like Carmelo Anthony, despite being a vet and at this point in his career, and maybe him not being the player that he once was, where he was regularly in that top five conversation, that he's playing or will play or is expected to play with a certain edge. Yeah. Um, given how, where, oh, all the doubt about whether or not he can be that guy again, 
And so him responding to this in some ways is, to it. is a good thing, right? I think he's going to have And a, you see players get upset about 2K ratings, all right? I, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I guess I just want what's best for him. <laughs> That's all I want. His dad? And I, and it, to be, no, no. I just, I've always liked him. I, right. I, like, I like him on and off the court. I, I just wish that he were in a different situation because there's no way if by some miracle somebody took Ryan Anderson's contract that he, if he were on the Rockets right now, he would not be projected to be the 64th yeah. best player, going, or even the Blazers for that matter. Right. The season didn't end the way uh, James Harden wanted, but the summer sure went his way. He got paid, and now he's on the cover of EA Sports' NBA Live 18. All right, James Harden joins us now on behalf of EA Sports NBA Live 18. Uh, James, congratulations. You sold at least one game. My nine-year-old son, when he saw you on the cover, demanded that his dad buy it for him. <laughs> but what does it mean to you uh, to be on the cover of uh, EA Sports NBA Live 18? Uh, man, as a kid, you know, you always, uh, you know, want to play video games, want to be a part of the game. Uh, now I'm on the cover. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an unbelievable experience, you know, and... Uh, just thank you know EA and uh, for giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. Uh, I'm excited for it and um, can't wait to uh, you know for everybody to play it. But every time I look up, I see you as Tom Brady playing with Chris Paul in Madden. So <laughs> a lot of video games being played, like <laughs> every that commercial. So what are you playing more these days, NBA Live or Madden? All of them, NBA Live, Madden, and FIFA. Uh, you know those are all, those are three games that's in my arsenal right now. I'm playing heavy and. Uh, uh, I want to challenge anybody that want it. You, you don't want nothing, dog. Don't even try. Oh, listen, <laughs> to him. listen to him. I retired this thing a long time ago, but I'll still give you that work. Don't worry about it. <laughs> now, let's, let's go on to, I guess, uh, reality basketball, that is. You've been right. playing some pickup games. And, of course, one of the people you've been playing pickup with or were playing with recently was Carmelo Anthony. Uh, everybody's heard the reports about him uh, wanting to come to Houston to play with you and, and CP3. How frustrating is it for you to be playing in these mm-hmm. pickup games with Melo hear these reports and yet there's no deal on the table you know I try to I try to block it out um, I let the front office and Daryl Morey and Tad Brown deal with that stuff I just try to focus on uh, you know getting, getting comfortable with CP you know I think that's uh, the first step uh, we've been building some uh, <clears throat> some some good bond time this summer and uh, you know I think we're both excited for the season what's the biggest adjustment for you and CP three uh, sharing a backcourt together what's the biggest adjustment you guys have to make uh, just to communicate, man. I think, you know, we've been both ball dominant so much these last few years that um, we're, we'll get a lot more catch and shoot opportunities. So we got to keep telling ourselves that when we're, when we're open, just shoot the ball. Uh, we've been doing that so far in these pickup games. But, uh, you know, once we get comfortable with each other, I mean, he's, he's very smart. I'm smart. Uh, things will work itself out. When you were talking to CP3 about coming to Houston, what was your main selling pitch? What was your major talking point with him to get him to come to Houston? No, we got the same goal. <laughs> we both trying to win. You know, we, it's one team out there that's winning. Uh, they've been to the finals three years in a row, and they won two out of three. So, um, you know, one team to compete against, one team to go, go try to get. And, uh, you know, we're on the same page with that. What kind of conversations, James, have you had with yourself this summer? And by that I mean looking at how last season ended and that last game in particular against San Antonio. How yeah. have you made sense of it, uh, and how are you using it going forward, that experience? Just that, just that whole year, you know, it was a good year. Uh, wasn't obviously what, you know, ended how you wanted to, but um, just doing so much, like having a ball in my hands, every possession, every play uh, for an entire season and then the postseason, uh, having you know, every defense uh, geared to stop you and just, it, it was tough. It was a lot, it was a lot, but, uh, you know, just got my mind right mentally and uh, prepared to, to go out there and, and, and be even better. Um, now we add Chris, it, it, you know, it takes me off the ball a little bit more to help me, you know, be able to play and, and, you know, have those fresh legs for, you know, later in the postseason. How do you feel like you guys match up with Golden State? Everybody's impressed with what you've done this offseason, but there's still this sentiment that it's Golden State's world and everybody else is just living in it. What do you say to that? Well, don't get me wrong. They're, they're very, very talented. You know, they're talented, but they're beatable. Um, you know, so you got you to gotta get the right players. You got to have the right personnel. You got to be able to score with them and uh, and get get stops when needed. Uh, but you got to be able to shoot shoot the ball at a high level, and I think our system fits that, and uh, I think our personnel now fits that as well. 
Now, obviously, the city of Houston has been through a lot with Hurricane Harvey. You donated $1 million mm -hmm. to Harvey Relief. What do you see as your role in helping Houston recover uh, from such a devastating natural disaster? Yeah, I don't think anybody saw that coming. Uh, you know, we thought we knew it was going to be a storm, but the way it hit was uh, devastating for the entire city. Um, I'm a part of the city, so I, I try to do whatever it takes and whatever I can do. Um, you know, whether it's money, whether it's uh, you know community service, whatever it is, to to you know to get the city back on their feet. Um, you know, so I met with the mayor when I landed in Houston, and we're putting you know a few things together um, to to get people back on their feet and, and, and get the city back to where it needs to be. How would you describe your connection with that community? You touched on it just now, but uh, seeing you respond to some people on Twitter with the hashtag Rocket for Life, promising to, to never leave, uh, and obviously a financial incentive not to leave, but just you seem to have really embraced that community. How would you describe your connection with, uh, with Houston and, and Rockets Nation? You know, Michael, like just the, the love that I've, I've received since I've been there, uh, you know, and I'm finally, I've been comfortable, but like I really can call it my home now, you know, so... Um, you know, I had just a charity weekend, uh, the weekend prior before Harvey hit, and um, you know, just to try to get back to the, the community, the city, uh, let them let them feel me a little bit, and uh, um, hopefully they're feeling me, and, and just so just try to try to give back, man, just try to be a part, try to let the fans and people know in the city that I'm here, and uh, I'm with them through it. A lot of Breakfast Club, a lot of Frenchies, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, nah, I, I was trying to say the six, but I got to say it. <laughs> now, uh, obviously, the season may not have ended the way you wanted it to, but I would say free agency period or the contract period, that ended exactly how you wanted it to with you getting a $228 million max uh, extension. How did you celebrate uh, that contract? Honestly, I didn't. I didn't. I got an extension last summer, and then... This one, I just, I stayed in the gym. Man. I, I made sure we got Chris and uh, then just kept working, kept working. It doesn't stop. Like the money isn't going to change anything. What, what drives me and motivates me is just to win, you know, put myself in a position to, to, to win a championship and, and multiple championships. So you said you didn't celebrate the $220 million extension, but if you had celebrated, um, wondering how you feel about the uh, the report, and maybe you can confirm this for us now that we got you, because we were fascinated by this. Jamel and I were completely impressed by the report that a local uh, gentleman's club in Houston had raised your jersey to the rafters. No, it was a banner. A banner? Right, and keep in mind, hey, this is a no judgment zone here. I'm about to say, <laughs> no, for hey, sure, listen, I, I have nothing to hide. I've never even seen it or heard it before. I just... Don't ruin a good no. story, James. Come on, go with it. I promise. That's a great Listen, story. <laughs> if, they, if they did, I would tell you. I don't got nothing to hide. I promise you, but I've never even seen it before. So no. I'll make sure I send y'all the picture, too. Hey, look, we, we, we loved it when we saw it. Yeah, I thought it's that was awesome. <laughs> Pun intended? Pun intended. That's <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> the jersey and the Raptors at the club. That was a bar. That was a bar. <laughs> no doubt. All right, man. We appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, continued success to you, and good luck next season. Appreciate y'all. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um... Well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, Sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Mike and Jamel are joined by Ryan Clark for a game of Take It or Leave It. Ryan, take it or leave it. Adrian Peterson and Sean Payton is a problematic partnership. I take that all the way, and here's why. They should have never got married in the first place. Sean Payton met him and wanted a trophy wife. This <laughs> The what he got is somebody that cook, clean, do the dishes, cut the grass, and all he wants the man to do is sit over there and look pretty. It's a bad from the jump. That's a great analogy, uh, but I'm going to leave this. I think if they were playing the Panthers, Adrian Peterson doesn't give him that look. It's like that, how, It's for Dalvin Cook. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just because it was about Dalvin Cook showing out. I told you yesterday, it's going to be more cutaways you to did. Peterson you did. than him cutting back and gaining yards. Right. This is an overblown story. I'm going to leave this because when you signed up, you knew what you were getting. Sean Payton likes to rotate backs like nobody's business. Very so true. when you signed with this team, you knew that you were not going to be the workhorse that you were. You weren't going to be able to get in that rhythm. Right. So this from is, but that, wife to that, that look, <laughs> <laughs> But that look 
didn't say he knew that, though, Mike. Hmm. It said he was in his feelings because he was in Minnesota. I got that. You yeah. know what I mean? So right. nothing to see here as far as I'm concerned. All right, take it or leave it, Ryan. Low-key Sam Bradford is a baller. Take it. Listen, he's been hurt. That was our issue with him. He gets beat up. And last year he threw the ball short, but he had me, Jamel Hill, <laughs> Michael Smith. That's who was blocking for him last year. Oh, right, you know right, what I mean? Right. This year he was able to get the ball out of his hands. And listen, he took some hits under duress That's last what night I like, and made man. passes on the money. I fool with Sam Bradford now. He might be hurt next week. <laughs> but when he out, that's why we say low key. Right. 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 Not, not, high key. Not, not high key. It's not low key. key. Uh, low key, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> low and high key. I'm you still hating on Sam Bradford? I believe this one. He had a great game, deserves a lot of respect for how he performed. But I'm sorry, the body of work is what it is. And I just re- expect him to regress to the mean. Yeah, but you got to look at the warts in that body of work as it relates to his surrounding cast, both in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we know what happened in Philly. Right. Line was a mess. Stephon Diggs was hurt a lot between Diggs and Thielen. He's got targets to make him mm-hmm. look good, along with Dalvin Cook. But, man, I'm with you. You hit it right on the head, Ryan. The thing, I judge quarterbacks by if you if you standing and delivering. If somebody knocking you out and you yep. still delivering that ball down the field, yep. okay, and he stands in the pocket. For all the talk about him being brittle, he's actually tough in the pocket. But so. I tell you what, you talk about his body of work, that's not as shameful as his actual body. <laughs> I need. I'm sorry. Get out of here, right? I'm sorry. Move Kobe on. Bryant has got an amazing <laughs> body of work. 20 years with the Los Angeles Lakers, 10 years each in jersey number 8 and 24. The Lakers are going to retire both numbers in December. Take it or leave it, Ryan. Take it retire twice. Numbers. I take it twice. If he wore another number, they should have retired that one too. <laughs> they need to retire his shorts, what he warmed up in, everything. Retire off that little wristband when he started wearing the <laughs> right, sleeve. Right. I want it all hung up. If he up. got old pieces of his fro, retire that too. Listen, I want it all hung up. I want the rap CD hung up. I want the picture with Tyra Bates he hung up. He deserves it. I want it. Prom all. pictures with Brandy, all of it. No. But you statement though, you take both of those guys. Yeah. You take the guy that wore eight, you take the guy that wore 24, they're both all the same. Cool. Superman, they look like the same person. Look, I leave this Why? because these, this jersey switching, A, is a market employee. That's number one. Let's just realize it for what it is, and that should not be rewarded. But when you do as much as he did in both jerseys, this ain't Jordan wearing 45. This exactly. wasn't a brief blip. You do as much as he did in both jerseys, yes, both of them going to Raptors. Absolutely. And it's selfish, man. Other people Why want other I know you ain't so calling somebody selfish. <laughs> Why are you so salty I'm and not, pessimistic today? Sam Bradford's body of work. I'm just trying to break What says about Sam Bradford and Kobe is the least of my Doug Baldwin is here now on behalf of Vizio's Big Screens for Big Plays. It awards a television to a fan each time a 40-yard play results in a touchdown. Sounds, sounds pretty, like a pretty good. good deal. <laughs> uh, 40 yards, my math is right. That's, uh, that's almost as much as y'all had against Green Bay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> too, uh, too soon, I know. I'm, I'm kidding. No, but seriously, Doug, 225 of offense against Green Bay. That was Seattle's fewest since 2014 against Dallas. What happened after you've had a chance to watch the film and review everything? We were all over the place, honestly. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't execute up front with our offensive line. We didn't uh, communicate well from the quarterback on out to the receivers and back to the, to the quarterback. Uh, we just, we were, we were sporadic, you know. And, and we've, we've been like this at times before, so there's really no need to panic. But, uh, you know, an extremely frustrating game for sure. What's the reason for that, having been here before in this position of, of seeing all the things you could have done and you know better than to do it that way? Why is that with you guys? I don't know. I, I truly don't know. You know, it, it seems to always happen. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we always have our struggles. But uh, for the most part, we come together th- midway through the season and figure it out. But uh, we have our struggles early. I would love for it not to be the case, but uh, I really don't know why it is the case. Now, one of the big plays in the game, or would have been a big play, was Nazaire Jones. His interception was called back because of a block in the back penalty. How much impact did that have? on the rest of the game and even in terms of what you guys wanted to do offensively? Yeah, we don't want to make uh, excuses for, you know, what took place in the game. But, yeah, it was a big play, a big swing, um, obviously taking seven points off the board. So uh, it, it was a huge turning point in the game for us. Um, you know, and, and I wouldn't say that, you know, it had any drastic impact on us offensively uh, because we were struggling before that. But uh, we would have, have loved to have the, that seven points on the board for sure. So 0 and 2, the history of teams that start 0 and 2, not very good. So you hate to call it a must win in week two. But are you guys treating it with that level of urgency? Like you got to handle business against San Francisco or this season could really be in trouble. So who, who told you to ask that question? 
because mm. you know as well as I do, it is not a must win. Exactly. <laughs> it's too, uh, it's unless you're about to get eliminated, a playoff game is a must win. I hear you. That's why I said it's not a must win. Right. But do you, is it really important but because you don't want to be 0-2? But the statistics do yeah. say something yeah. about teams to start 0-2 <laughs> in terms of not making the playoffs. I ask my own questions, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering. And, and, and if to, to to your point, yes, of course. You know, there's there's not a lot of great history with teams who start 0-2, um, but that's that's outside of our concern. And you know, not really worried about what history says. That that's that's why it's history. Um, for us, we're just really focused on what we can control, and that's getting right this week. You know, we have an opportunity um, to to come back home in our home stadium. Uh, and, and get our get our football right, and play the style of football that we know we're capable of playing. Um, and so, no, it's not a must-win. You know, for us, it's, we don't even really think of it like that. We think of this as another championship opportunity to show what we're capable of and playing the best style of, of Seahawks football that we're capable of playing. Man, I don't know if I should ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> Got angry, Doug Baldwin. Now, uh, should I bother asking you about the officiating on Sunday, which was questionable from I mean, a Seahawks know, perspective? You know what my answer is. You know, you know what my answer is going to be. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we just thought we and that's, we, that we should say care. enough. You know what y'all really need? You need a nutritious breakfast. Mm, maybe some. Baldwin <laughs> smacks, perhaps that could be yeah. what Baldwin could cure you gotta uh, get you some. the Seahawks. <laughs> so you have your own cereal. A lot of people just wait around. Until, Which is a life goal, by the way. Exactly. A lot of people wait around until they're on the Wheaties box. You didn't. You have your own cereal. So tell us how that came about. Uh, I was approached with an opportunity to, uh, to raise some funds for uh, a, a, a foundation back home that I support. Um, and this was one of the opportunities to do so. And it was unique. It was different, you know. And so um, you guys know me. I like to do things a little bit differently outside of the box. So literally outside of the box or inside <laughs> the box, I should say, with this cereal. So, uh, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's a great cereal. Part of a balanced nutritional breakfast. Go try it. That's right. Sell that cereal right there. Right there. Keep doing things out of the box. Doug Baldwin here for Vizio's Big Screens for Big Plays. Thanks for joining the six. And good luck in that must-win game against the 49ers <laughs> in week two. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. Thanks All for right, having me. Be you. good. All right, who's doing too much? All right, I know one thing. I'm not going to get on this ref for something I know I'll do at some point this NFL season. Take a listen. Rivers tried to get the timeout, and I think he got it. First, charge timeout, San Diego. Old head is die hard. I'm saying. I, I like every. I have to consciously think not to call them. Yeah, no, no, I'm Diego. talking about the fact that they lost another close game. Oh, so one sorry. and nine <laughs> since last year, game decided about seven points or fewer. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. Like you know, I want San Diego to be great. You know how I feel about Philip Rivers. But look, the way they played, at least for most of this game, until kind of those critical moments, they didn't really deserve to win this game. No, Trevor Simeon looked all right though. He did look really good. Right. Um, so USC and Texas, they play Saturday. For the first time since that wonderful 06 Rose Bowl that we all remember. But apparently we're not supposed to remember it because in the USC game notes, that game never happened. (laughs) USC says the NCAA directed them to treat the Texas loss as vacated. You ain't got to play into this. (laughs) You could have put an asterisk next to it or something. We all saw it. You ain't got to play into it. Let the NCAA handle this business. Don't sit up there and act like one of the greatest wins in college football history didn't happen. Game sold out, though. Should be a good one. But then it's not a rematch then. So you no. can't build it as a rematch. <laughs> right. <laughs> because <laughs> it never happened. It never happened. You're selling them tickets like it's a rematch. Darwin Barney of the Blue Jays. Almost. Had some trouble sliding in the third base last night. A little bit. Uh, third base is never a problem for most of us. Uh, that was great, though. That was really, that was a great slide. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can resist. You cannot uh, resist. There you go. You got that one with the other. Uh-huh. The Royals fan went for this home run last night. Did a little too much. Did he, did he at least get the ball? That's what I want to know. Did he make the catch? Uh, did somebody give him a ball to take home for his trouble? <laughs> that could have been I never understand really why bad. people get so excited about home run balls. But at least this was a home run ball as opposed as to a foul ball. ball. Like, at least they didn't have a kid, a which we often have people with videos of kids. All right. KD, new yep. KD tins, which looked really good. Uh, his final shoes. Literally a message to the haters. Literally. I love it. 
Do you? That's how you turn a frown upside down. Well, he already had the cup. Like, are we at a point where this is a little worn out? He already had the cupcake thing. Not if you can monetize it. He should. You know what? All of the stuff he took last summer he should just and into the it. season, he deserves to put whatever he wants on whatever he wants and sell it and make some money. But I like it. It's creative. I mean, it's it's got the. I mean, it's no accident. It's got all the criticisms underneath it, yeah. but all the accomplishments and the stat lines. It just, it's like, shut up. It's like, shut up. See, if I had last shoes, they just say He deserves a last lap. Like, this high school quarterback looking like me at 35 back in the day. <laughs> what? Still find a way to throw the touchdown. Way to keep the play alive. We ain't never made a play that good, Michael Smith. No, mine just wasn't on film. Because oh, back then we had the grainy be- film. Okay. But we talked pickup with James Harden earlier. I consider LeBron and D-Wade working out together in late practice. Yeah, totally. Because I mean, it's, it's inevitable that they end up together, right? It is, but that, but again, this if, year, if this, if D Wade wasn't in the situation he's in with the Bulls, I think they'd still be doing this. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking forward to the day when D Wade's a Cavs. Okay. Because you add D Wade to the mix, it's, it's just little by little getting closer to going. Oh, there you go. Healthy Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Certainly make things. Give me a fourth one of Warriors. Very, Cavs. very interesting. That's for sure. But this is like the dinner thing. It's like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, I'm not making. It. All right, uh, NFL free agent RG3, he is spending his time in the gym, too, okay. playing ball. <laughs> With a hoodie, though. Like Hoodie Bellow. You bury the lead. Hoodie RG3. Right. Looking kind of good out there. I don't know if this will help him get back in the NFL necessarily, but I guess good to see him out and about. I didn't know he, I didn't know he had uh, hoop skills. Not surprised. Yeah, me neither, considering what a great athlete he was. Your man, Baker Mayfield, atop the Heisman watch on ESPN.com, edging Lamar Jackson. Will that be the case after Lamar Jackson puts on a show, call it now, Saturday night against Clemson on ABC? Oh, way to give that super hot take. That's why I get paid the big bucks. (laughs) Uh, I think Lamar Jackson will have a good game, but they will not win. And so the fact that Baker Mayfield has already beaten a top three team with Ohio State, and he still has Oklahoma State to go. Before we call it a day, tell the people had a good day. All right, the Oakland A's, April 17th, home game against the White Sox next season will mark the 50th anniversary of the A's playing in Oakland Coliseum, and it will be free, free to the public. A's are promoting that as one of a kind in Major League history. All right, uh, speaking of free, so Sunday's Jaguars game against the Titans, it is staying in Jacksonville, but owner Shah Khan, beyond donating a million dollars to Hurricane Relief, is donating 5,000 tickets to first responders. Real classy. We will see y'all tomorrow.